そういうものがまあでも失われるのを全部否定するわけにはとてもいきませんその今僕らこういう生活してるわけですからだけどあのどうしてここをなくしちゃうんだろうっていうところってあるんですよね。Isayo Takahata had a very different entry into the world of filmmaking. He was originally born in Ise in 1935, and off the bat, he experienced something dreadful, which first shaped his storytelling abilities. Tensions were high between Japan and the majority of the Western world, and Isayo and his family were unfortunately stuck in the middle of it. Him and his family suffered a massive US air raid on Okayama City. When he was just nine years old, and it's something that no child should experience. There aren't many, if not any, post records of this incident which affected them so much, but I would hedge a guess that though Takahata himself hadn't realized it yet, he was starting to understand human nature in a way not as many people these days would come to experience. Which is a good thing. I don't need to explain how horrific war is, especially with our own current conflicts going on. Impressively, Isayo and his family stuck it out because what other option was there in World War II? World War II had come to an end in a string of events, the final toll being recorded in Japan upon the release of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I've always found it really fascinating how Japan saw a massive resurgence in technology post World War II. It essentially closed itself off from the outside world and Isayo was there throughout this entire expansion. I think this was the period where Isayo began to develop his artistic vision. Over the years, he must have seen massive areas of countryside and landscape be demolished, all for resources to be transported to Tokyo and greater cities, which of course, now Tokyo is the largest City in the world. People started to move out of the countryside to head into the vast city, and slowly the population began to decrease. It's an issue which is still going. There's so many abandoned settlements and buildings around the countryside of Japan. What Isayo considered was the animals whose homes were getting destroyed, and it's the idea that something so pure and natural could be ripped apart thanks to human involvement. And I think this is the exact period which inspired the storyline for Pompoko, for the animals to fight back. He graduated from the University of Tokyo with a degree in French literature, which is quite surprising considering where he actually ended up. I think it's quite an interesting choice for him. See, during university, he'd actually seen a French film called The King and the Mockingbird, and this is where the dots start to connect. This is where Isayo Takahata starts to become interested in animation. So further down the line, he was actually recommended to work in an animation studio, which is called Toei, which is still going strong today, and of course, he completely aced the entrance exams because that's just what he does. And he worked on a handful of projects before making his directorial debut. The Great Adventure of Horus, Prince of the Sun. Now, if you enjoyed this video, maybe consider subscribing because it just really means the world. When I watch an Isayo Takahata film, there is always one significant thing that stands out to me, and it's the simplicity. And I don't mean it's lacking anything profound. In fact, it's quite the opposite. I'd consider Takahata to be Mr. Profound. No, what I really mean is how they remain so calm, so grounded in reality, regardless of there being fantastical elements involved. See, when someone thinks of Studio Ghibli, the majority probably think of Princess Mononoke, Spirited Away, Howl's Moving Castle, Totoro, you know, those sort of things. And all of these films are, of course, works by the great Hayao Miyazaki, but Ghibli isn't just Hayao. No, <laughs> it's his son too. <laughs> No, the studio is, of course, comprised of many artists who have put their life and soul into their filmmaking craft, into this studio, which has cultivated so many weird and wonderful films for us over the years. But what was it that made Iseo, in particular, so remarkable and gave him the ability to affect us so much? People back in the day were just starting to realize, hey, this Iseo guy is kind of good at making films, and you've got Miyazaki just there smoking a cigar saying, yeah, why do you think I chose to work with him? You have to keep this in mind. This man wasn't necessarily an animator. His process of learning would have been far different to Hayo's because Isayo needed to put all of his eggs into the directorial vision basket. And that's without having first-hand drawn experiences on his work. Unlike Miyazaki, who contributed massively to the artistry of his work, Isayo had to take a different route and actually gather people together and say, okay guys, we're gonna need to make this right. And this is why so many newcomers get slightly confused as to who directed each Ghibli film, because of course, they're 
usually share in the exact same animation departments. But I think the first hurdle Iseo had to overcome was to make something completely in his own voice. Something that defined him as a figurehead for Studio Ghibli. And that is where we reach 1988, with Grave of the Fireflies. This film is introduced in the most solemn way imaginable. Not with blood and chaos and crazy sound design, but with a quiet train station. And probably the most powerful, yet brief exposition you'll ever hear. September 21st, 1945. That was the night I died. The biggest standing point of Iseo is how he interweaves humanization into his work. You really believe his characters are real people. I can only ask that when you watch a Takahata film, just observe what the characters are doing. Their smallest movements, their slightest facial expressions, even their tiniest mannerisms. It's true that animation is embellishment to emphasize movement, to emphasize emotion, but Iseo is remarkable because he perfectly encapsulates human emotion in characters that we'd previously consider non-existent. And that's a skill that can take decades to master. The smallest example of this is at the very beginning when Saita is looking for Setsuko's doll. He hesitates, trying to think of where Setsuko left it, and then he finally sees it, grabs it, and hurries away. This didn't need to be done at all, but it grounds them. It makes them vulnerable. It shows us they are human, it shows us their flaws. And this film, in particular, taps into the human condition like no other. The scenes of the wreckage, the aftermath of the explosions of the air raid, the burnt bodies, the devastation. To think it all came from experience, from someone who had witnessed all of this firsthand. Many past and modern day filmmakers would opt to replicate these type of events, these personal events, into live action, but Iseo chooses not to because he doesn't need to. When the characters already feel so human, when the atmosphere is so dense with emotion, it would almost be counterintuitive for a director to play in a realm they're not used to. Iseo is animation. When Saita sees his mum in the hospital, it just hit me in a way I don't think would affect me in the same way if it were live action. From this scene, which many are familiar with, the composition is, of course, wonderful. The landscape is what artists would call a matte painting. It's essentially a still image on the background, and it brings focus to the subject of importance. The streets and fields of Kobe are bleak, destroyed, and in the midground, Saito. His back is turned to the audience, his emotions are bottled. In the foreground, Setsuko, who wants to see her mother, who doesn't know her mother's fate yet. She faces to the side and weeps, and the posture she's in keeps her on the same level as Saito, so both characters are framed to insinuate different emotions whilst being in the same predicament. We cut to the wide shot, and it's the duality of the two. Setsuko is devastated and miserable and wants to see her mother, and Saito just <laughs> wants to move on and wants to bottle up and tries to make her feel happy because that's his role, to be the big brother and to look after her. And this emotion is demonstrated unbelievably well. It's not just a testament on the effectiveness of the animation and the visuals, but also the actors, the voice actors. Ayano Shiriishi was just five at the time of recording, and yet every single line is delivered with such raw emotion, it makes you go, damn. This is a film film. Everything is for a reason, even in the smallest of things. At the half hour mark, there's a shot of a bird feeding their children, and this shot probably lasts no longer than three seconds. But it doesn't take a genius to find the parallels between this and the characters. We immediately cut to Saita taking Setsuko to the beach. To merge the characters' motives with the surrounding environment, the visual tone, and furthermore the sound design, is something Iseo only gets better at with every film he directs. I found this was really the start of how Iseo would demonstrate emotional contrast through the means of technical decision making. We already know at the start of the film in Medium Res that Saita is going to die of starvation, alone, at the Sanemiya train station, but 
From the lead up to these events is a window into the life of two remarkable children during and post World War II. And what's really hard hitting about this film is that Saita and Setsuko really have no one else to help them. They're just two lonely souls who will seemingly never be remembered. But the film in itself, adapted from the original novel, seeks to give these lost souls a place in the world, to represent those who passed away during World War II as fireflies who died far too young. Anyway, <laughs> let's move on from Misery, because I actually want this to be a positive video, so going back to animating emotion. I found a similar shot in Only Yesterday, which really impressed me. It only happens for like a few frames, and it's when Toshio actually runs to check the passing train. The way he's out of breath and just in a panic is so fluently animated. It's like this one shot just took me away. Children play a huge role in Ghibli films, and it's for a really good reason. With an innocent and creative mind, you can use these characters as a catalyst to inspire the visuals. We can come up with a lot of crazy ideas when we're younger, and as we get older, they start to sort of dwindle a little bit because of the mundanity of life. But it's actually a bit of a staple for the best artists and even musicians to take aspects from childhood, to take that original creativity and let it expand in a mature work. I think Iseyo maintains that childlike mentality to be able to combine the experience he's had in his life with his youthful mind, and it naturally creates worlds that are really complex both in design and narrative. Only Yesterday is a homage to childhood. Looking back on the past is important, but as Takio learns, it's really about focusing on the present, to make her own decisions and not get held down by preconceived expectations. Her dad in this film just angered me. <laughs> it's a very subtle film. If you would completely base it on the character's journey, you wouldn't initially think it would be a two hour runtime, but it is. Iseo likes to take his time to explore a character, and naturally the more we understand them, the more we understand the philosophies embedded in the story. And this is where Iseo really shines his philosophies. What's interesting about the tale of Princess Kaguya is the visuals are so distinct from Ghibli's other work, and the style is more reminiscent of Impressionism, adopting Japanese brush-style watercolours instead of the look we are so familiar with. He kind of experimented with this type of aesthetic in My Neighbour the Yamadas, which is, again, another really underrated masterpiece of his, to take something so mundane as an average Tokyo family and transform it into this bizarre world, this cartoonish world, because the aesthetic of it is based on the original cartoon strip, and that's an amazing film too. Especially because it utilised computer animation, which in 1999 was on a massive rise. So when it comes to Kaguya, the style makes even more sense, as Isayo wanted to further encapsulate the origins of the story, the tale of the bamboo cutter, which is a monogatari from the Hidden period of Japan. It's essentially a gigantic art piece, which contains watercolours, and they are just amazing to look at. I feel like the art style in Kaguya is a homage to old Japanese paintings. I just feel like it ties comfortably with how Iseo looked to the past to derive inspiration by maintaining old values and keeping them alive. And it's weirdly similar, to me at least, of Gunpei Yokoi, who designed the Game Boy for Nintendo, and his philosophy was lateral thinking with withered technology. Again, it's taken from the past and turning it into something modern, something new, something innovative. It never forgets the fundamental roots. I mentioned Iseyo's philosophy earlier, and I believe that is on very similar lines to this very idea. The Tale of Princess Kaguya was the last film Iseyo Takahata made. It was a story about a girl from the moon, and she's found in a bamboo shoot. She is raised as a princess and is taught royal manners. She's taught about hierarchy and about the repercussions of disobedience. Because, as everyone knows, if you do a single thing wrong in life, you get sucked off to the moon. Till she got sucked off. I'm sorry. But what really stood out to me was the depiction of Buddhism in this story. See, one of the greatest lessons taught in Buddhism is impermanence. The idea that suffering and loss is entirely natural. I remember reading the parable of Kisa and the mustard seeds back when I studied philosophy A-level, and um, yeah, that, that stuck with me, and I think it parallels with this weirdly well. It's the hardship Siddhartha had to go through in order to reach enlightenment, and unfortunately with this, Princess Kaguya is on the receiving end. She, as a character, is actually used as a vessel to teach people around her. She knows what she wants, and the people around her have to come to accept it. It's almost like the people around Kaguya represent Kisa, and Kaguya represents the mustard seed. 
If you don't know what this parable is, I'm just talking absolute nonsense. <laughs> Basically, what I'm saying is some things just don't stick around. From watching Isayo Takahata's films, I discovered a lot more than I thought I ever would. And to me, he really changed not only the trajectory of Studio Ghibli, but animation as an art form. These days, we're bombarded with fast-paced content. We're given loads of large-scale narratives, and coming back to Isayo's work, it just makes the world slow down a little, in the best way possible. It's probably quite cliche, but it just makes you think about the little things in life. It allows us to recall our own past experiences and to really consider what our place is in the world and what we can do to change things if we so desire. I'm lucky to have discovered Takahata's works so young because it's this passion and care that makes me want to work harder on my own goals, but it's also something to come back to and say maybe I might have a different interpretation on these complex characters. It's clear he's written his life and soul into his work, and the results speak for themselves. And if you haven't already, I really urge you to watch some of his works, any of them, because they are all fantastic. And you know what? I think you have time, because his work, it's the type of stuff that just lives forever.